Well, thank you for the great welcome. I'm really pleased to be in Dublin. I don't really know enough people in Dublin. That's why I keep having to come back here. That is my ambition and my aim, and I will certainly do that. I'm thrilled to be here, and this is, uh, I know, a wonderful audience. I can see that uh, already. And the title, maybe I should explain that a little bit. Clearly, one has to be a bit provocative. Uh, I think the euro, as it was originally conceived, has come to an end, and, and we are now carrying out a blame game about who is responsible for that. So I hope at the end of our who done it uh, here today, we'll have a few more clues laid down uh, in the sand uh, as to why that should be. Um, it was said that uh, I was stimulating before lunch. Well, th that of course is unusual for Dublin to have stimulants before lunch. Uh, but I think maybe there is something in this, there's a, a deeper meaning here, because I think the Irish have been very good during the whole crisis at getting their retaliation in early. So to have stimulants before lunch maybe is the way forward uh, for the Irish economy. Um, regarding the euro, which is after all the theme, uh, I would like to make three sets of remarks, and, and very, very simple, really. You know, why do we have the euro? Uh, what has happened since the euro was introduced? Uh, and what will possibly happen next? And also, where uh, does Ireland play a role in all this? But, so you need to go back to first principles. And this is, after all, the most uh, emblematic and the most ambitious most important European project that there's been since the Second World War. So we need to deal with this with a certain amount of historical circumspection and a certain amount of detective work needs to go into the idea of why do we have it. I mean, just very briefly, uh, four reasons why we do have the euro, some of which are who made, you might say, and some of which are more international. I mean, first of all, the whole act of rapprochement between France and Germany, which has been going on you might say, uh, ever since the Franco-Prussian War, um, has certainly been going on since the Second World War. So this is a kind of denouement for the uh, act of reconciliation between France and Germany since World War II. And one has to put this in the context of the search for political union between European peoples. So monetary union, as we all know, is far more than just a monetary project. It is a political project, and it has to be put against the context of that long search for the two uh, biggest, most important nations on the mainland to come together and, and to forge uh, a new unity after all their differences of the last two centuries. Um, I noticed the picture of Jacques Delors downstairs. That really is the second reason to complete the single market, the mantra of a single currency for a single market, uh, the idea being that you could only really have a full market where you can exchange goods and labor and ideas and capital across borders if you have a single currency to go with it. That was something laid down in the 1980s uh, under Jacques Delors. Uh, that was the fulfillment of an old idea, an old dream that certainly goes back to Victor Hugo, if not back to the Roman Empire, that Europe needed a unifying force to turn it also into an effective trading area, uh, a, a single currency. But third point, this is where the Americans come in. And you, you can't neglect the Americans in the whole of this story for both positive and negative reasons. And that's what makes it also so interesting. You have to look at the euro in a properly in international context. Uh, there was a necessity uh, by many Europeans uh, after the war to try to rival the monopoly power of the dollar on the world financial markets. There was the idea that the Americans were really able to get away with murder for too long by issuing their currency, the so-called exorbitant privilege of the dollar, which was a phrase which was actually invented by Giscard d'Estaing during the 1960s, although made popular by his sidekick, uh, General de Gaulle, because, of course, uh, Giscard d'Estaing was the finance minister all those years ago under de Gaulle, or one of his finance ministers. The idea that the Americans had this ability to simply print dollars and therefore finance their own deficit without tears uh, by reaping the benefit of having a monopoly power of issuance. The Europeans wanted a little bit of that, or at least they wanted to deny the Americans the ability themselves to profit from that sole monopoly. The French, of course, were the ones who mostly saw themselves as rivals. Uh, the Germans were simply keen to deny the Americans the, the profit of, of that monopoly power. The Germans, interestingly enough, as a parenthesis, saw the dangers of becoming a reserve currency, so they had 
no great ambition, no great hubris about this. This was the French who really did want the euro to become an absolute <coughs> rival to the dollar. And, and the fourth reason, it becomes more and more cogent and more and more relevant after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, was to really put Germany in its place. It was to control the Germans. Because the idea had grown up uh, over the 20 or 30 years beforehand that the D-Mark and the Bundesbank had become the new emblems and the new signals of German power. And the Germans were, to use a phrase of Mrs. Thatcher, becoming a little bit uppity and therefore needed to put e be put in their place, particularly after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the very quick burst of unity that came about as a result of the fall of the wall. Suddenly, uh, a new, imposing, more populous, uh, perhaps more powerful Germany seemed to be on the horizon. And therefore, the age-old dream of monetary unity in Europe uh, became instrumentalized in a new dream of trying to curtail what seemed to be uh, a new, still more powerful, still more energetic, still more industrious German nation, which suddenly appeared on the horizon. And so the dream of monetary union, and indeed even the groundwork for monetary union, goes back a long way. The Delors report, which laid down some of the guideposts for monetary union, of course was conceived of and even fulfilled before the Berlin Wall fell. So you can't say the Berlin Wall spurred the march to European monetary union, but it certainly catalyzed something which, which was there already. It is interesting, though, that if you look at the facts and you look at the archives and you talk to the people involved, uh, the Germans didn't bargain away the D-mark for a mess of pottage. They actually got a very good price for bargaining away the D-marks. It wasn't as though Helmut Kohl let down his guard uh, and said, in order that we get unification, uh, we give away the D-mark. No, not at all. And also Mitterrand, the wily old fox that he was, he knew that unification was going to happen. One of the most extraordinary things is that if you do look at some of the papers, and I wouldn't have believed it had I not seen this in both the German and the French archives, that Mitterrand told both Schmidt and Kohl as chancellors uh, at the beginning of the 1980s that he thought that German unification would happen by the end of the century because the Soviet Union would go through a phase of weakness. So Mitterrand knew that Germany would become unified and he even knew in 1989 that the Germans would go forward rather quickly on the march towards unification. <coughs> the, he didn't say you know, the, the Germans must give up their D mark and then I'll allow it. It was going to take place anyway. Kohl very wisely saw that there was a lot of suspicion about Germany and its motives and its ambitions, and therefore he decided to throw the D mark into the melting pot. But as I say, he, he did actually set tougher conditions uh, for the other Europeans to leap over uh, as the condition for going down towards monetary union. And I think it's one of the legacies which are still with us today, that France quite reluctantly did accede to some of those conditions. And some of those conditions, such as, for instance, a European central bank, which is even more independent uh, and even less accountable than the Bundesbank, that was one of the conditions. And that's one of the legacies that we have with us now and is still a thorn in the flesh, I would say, of France. So those are the, the, the four main reasons. It's worthwhile just bearing that in mind, um, because if you actually look at what has happened, it has been a disappointment. Uh, none of those four conditions has been perfectly fulfilled, and I would argue that some of them uh, have, have gone into reverse. I don't see now a great spirit of rapprochement between France and Germany. Of course, people will always make deals, there will always be visits, there will always be ceremony, there will always be walks on the sand in Deauville or walks in back gardens of various people's homes uh, in Berlin or wherever. And there will always be a lot of dialogue and always be a lot of interplay between Berlin and Paris. But one does miss these days a common political purpose and even a sense of proper dialogue between Sarkozy and Merkel. Uh, and therefore, if we compare that with all the various tandems of the past, I would think we would say that those two, in epitomizing the Franco-German dialogue, they, they do lead a certain they do leave a certain amount to be desired. In terms of the single market, there's actually been more trade integration statistically in the years leading up to the birth of the single currency in 1999 than there has been since then, partly because Europe has been a slow growth area and therefore countries, whether Ireland or Belgium or Italy or France or Germany, have been doing more trade with countries outside. 
Um, and these countries have been very dynamic. And therefore, if you look at the trade statistics, the amount of integration of trade between the different countries of EMU has actually gone down compared with the period in the 1980s. If you look at the, uh, the dollar, well, it is true that the euro has now become the second most uh, important reserve currency in the world. But that's actually partly because the Chinese and the Asian uh, countries that demand to have a, a second currency for investment in their reserves, they want to have an alternative to the dollar. So this is not so much as though this is a European policy. It's become a Chinese policy. The Chinese have amassed these uh, foreign currency reserves for, for various reasons, most of which are not particularly good reasons, and they demand to have a second string to their bow. So it's a little bit like if you're Aer Lingus or British Airways, you don't want to simply buy Boeing. There has to be an Airbus. And you could say that the euro is, is the Airbus to the American Boeing. So somebody would have to fulfill this role. And I don't think that anybody thinks the euro is going to somehow supplant the dollar. It's a kind of good number two reserve currency. It, it does mean, though, that of course, that the Chinese and the other large holders of reserves in Asia which now make up uh, about six or seven trillion dollars worth of reserves. I mean, soon we'll be talking about real money, I would say. You know, they have made an, a vast investment in the euro, and they mean to keep it going. This is one of the reasons, although why the original purpose, I believe, of the euro has been subverted, the euro will continue to be around with us. Uh, and then if you take the fourth um, reason to keep the Germans down, well, of course, the Germans are going through a difficult period at the moment because they appear to the rest of the world to be very strong. They themselves think of themselves as being somewhat weak. They do have an economy which does seem to have traversed all the travails of the last 10 years in very good working order. But, of course, the Germans are never more anxious when things start to look as though they're going well because there's this old saying, as you all know in German, that the light at the end of the tunnel is only the light of the approaching train. Uh, uh, and so the Germans don't feel particularly well, even though they do look successful. It, it does seem, though, as though the Germans are throwing their weight around somewhat more than they did 20 years ago. So the old idea that you would somehow emasculate the D-Mark and take over the Bundesbank and put it into that nice new institution, the ECB, in order to somehow throttle them and constrain their power, I never really felt that was going to work. It doesn't seem to have been fulfilled. So none of those four... Um, principal reasons, I would say, has been uh, adequately fulfilled, and some of them have been downright disappointments. Now, what has happened? Again, you need to split it up into three parts, really. Um, the, the first part of the Euro story, uh, the whole idea of the one-size-fits-all monetary policy is that, manifestly, one size won't always fit all. Therefore, you will have periods when some countries which are prone to more inflation uh, will have interest rates which are certainly too low for their economic position. And countries which have less inflation and lower growth will have, con will have interest rates which are too high. And that was the case in the first five years of the euro. Uh, none of this at all was in any way surprising. And it was not only unsurprising, it, it was predictable, and indeed it was predicted. Many people said that some countries will be using the opportunity of the euro uh, as an opportunity simply to let rip, to finance consumer booms, to finance speculative booms, to speculate, to speculate on areas like property and so on. And that is exactly what did happen in many countries of the euro area. And the folly of the politicians in many cases was that they allowed this to happen without thinking someday the money and the luck will run out. This, this was, if you like, a gift, a, a dowry, of the Germans that the other countries went into monetary union, automatically the interest rates descended to a German level. And instead of using the low interest rates in a wise way to finance investment, to finance uh, a decent education system, to make their countries more competitive, uh, they decided simply to go on a long drawn out binge. Uh, and that is certainly what happened in uh, a certain number of southern countries. And arguably that's what happened in Ireland as well, particularly if you look at the, the property market. But you see, many people were complicit in this. If I was the Queen, like she went to the London School of Economics a few years ago and asked uh, in her rather plaintive, high-pitched, penetrating voice, did anybody foresee the credit crisis? Nobody did. In the same way, 
nobody really foresaw the euro would really come unstuck quite to the extent that it did. And that was because everybody did seem to be profiting from this first five years when the interest rates across Europe all seemed miraculously to have descended to the German level. Everybody could seem to finance themselves in a new nirvana. Uh, there seemed to be no pain, uh, only gain. The politicians were very happy because even the financial markets, those blackguards, those villains, the people that normally bring all the politicians' dreams tumbling down, even the financial markets seemed to buy into this idea that countries as far apart as Greece and Germany were properly convergent. The European Central Bank could hardly believe its luck because suddenly it had created a huge wad of uh, risk-free paper, uh, government bonds, which seemed to be trading around Europe at the same price. And in order to carry out monetary policy across a unified financial area, there's nothing better than to have this mass of collateral which is more or less priced at the same level. And because the uh, financial market seemed to buy into this, uh, the politicians also thought, well, we don't really need to do anything else. We've basically done our homework. We don't need to carry on with any greater reforms. Let's just live life as we've done it, because the financial market seemed to have bought into our story. The politicians didn't realise that the financial markets do not take friends, they do not have feelings, they do not support or not support any particular policy. The financial markets are simply out there to make money. And a lot of people on the financial markets made a lot of money by buying Greek bonds and driving the uh, prices up to the same levels as the Germans. And exactly the same people now turned into rascally speculators have been making a lot of money by selling Greek bonds in, in the last three or four years. So this was just a financial market phenomenon, a bubble which was uh, on the way to being formed and which had inevitably to burst. You then move into the second phase. Why did it burst? Why didn't it go on? And then you come into the credit crisis, which did have its seeds, of course, in America, which burst upon the shores of Europe in 2007. And of course, that then sent every nation in Europe into a tailspin because there was a contraction to world trade. And every nation in Europe seemed to be affected by that. The German economy went down by 5% in uh, 2009. The Italian economy went down by... 5%. The British economy went down by 5%, even though we're not part of the euro. And so you could say uh, that at that time, we still were in a pattern of some convergence. The music had, though, started to change. And above all, uh, I, I would say the key had changed, because suddenly the financial markets, which had been um, extremely compliant and extremely complacent and seemed to be buying into the convergence idea, um, they suddenly became much more risk averse. And therefore, risk in countries' borrowings, risk in the government bonds that different countries issue, suddenly started to become more of a factor than it had done before, just in the same way as the American bankers started to look at the credit standing of a couple who might have bought a house uh, in Newmont. They suddenly started looking at the credit standing of a government like Greece, which had started to issue bonds, and suddenly noticed that the credit standing of that Greek government wasn't anything like as good as the French or the Dutch government. So you, you had an increasing risk aversion suddenly by the banks and the other lenders. And then you also had the spectre of the Germans coming out of recession uh, more quickly and more vigorously than anybody else. You see, because hidden by that apparent convergence in the first five or six years, the Germans actually, rather secretly, you might say, although it was fully open to people who read the Financial Times and other such organs, uh, had been um, repairing their house. Not in a great um, grandiose way, because the Germans don't really go in for things like that these days, and not so much because of the government. Schroeder, I think, um, did do the right thing. He, he did preside over a government which did allow the companies, particularly the Mittelstand, the family-owned enterprises, to repair their lagging competitiveness they also reformed labour markets to a certain extent, although nothing like in the direction of Reagan-esque or Thatcher-esque hire and fire, but they did make labour markets more flexible. And they allowed labour costs to fall uh, compared with the other countries in Europe uh, whose economies had been allowed to get out of control in a positive direction and, and had too many costs built into them. So that was really not taken on board at all by the financial markets, the fact that the Germans had been reducing their costs. Also a great period of uh, industrial rejuvenation. A lot of you have seen 
the German company heads over the years. Normally, they are elderly gentlemen of a certain respectability with hardly any hair. And now, uh, the people who are running German companies, uh, you know, if you haven't become a German company manager by the age of 39, you know, you really have, you're really past it. You, you should go and do something else. There's been a huge uh, rejuvenation of German company management, and I would say a huge professionalization. All that went across fairly unnoticed, with the effect that the Germans were quickest out of recession. And this led to, I think, a repricing of countries' debt uh, on the markets, a much less forgiving atmosphere. And then suddenly we have markets going into a, uh, a, a reversal uh, of what had happened before. So suddenly the interest rate starts to rise on the bonds issued by Greece or Spain or Portugal. The famous spreads uh, start to increase. And suddenly then we go into reverse of the position that we had before. Um, and it's been a, a credit boom which has been unveiled uh, as a bubble and which has now been burst. Th that if you like, is the story of the two-speed Europe, which is now emerging. Now, who would I blame for all this? Well, I, I would blame, of course, the politicians, because, you see, if this was a political project, and it's always said that, indeed, that was what it was, then the politicians should have been alive to what was going on. Uh, and there should have been more political checks and balances built into systems. There should be more... Um, uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy, you might say to counter uh, somewhat too easy monetary policy. But I would go much further than that. I would also say the ECP was complicit. There's been many, many cases, and some of them I chronicle in the updated version of my book, uh, where the ECB fell into this trap of complacency. Mr. Van Rompuy, who I think was here the other day, uh, he made this somewhat incautious remark to um, a, an ex-colleague of mine on the Financial Times, he said, we fell under a narcotic spell. Well, if I was a politician, I wouldn't actually use language like that. I certainly wouldn't allow any journalist to write it down. But anyway, he said it, and that's what it was. It was a narcotic spell. But you see, the ECB also fell under the narcotic spell. As I said earlier, they could hardly believe their good fortune. And so the European Central Bank uh, wrote loads and loads of scripts basically saluting uh, this great convergence which seems to have come along. Uh, there's a particular report, a bulletin, which they did in August 2007, so less than four years ago, where in their technocratic way, the European Central Bank was casting its eye around uh, looking at all the really infamous examples of countries around the world which were living beyond their means uh, and castigating the Americans or the Chinese or the Japanese, some were living beyond their means, some weren't living according to their means, some had def deficits which were too high, and some had surpluses which were too high. You know, 6% was the American current account deficit at that time. And in, in this 12-page article about current account imbalances around the world, which the ECB said is going to be the source of great calamity and upheaval in the world economy, not once did they mention that within the monetary union itself, you had Greece running a current account deficit of 10% of GDP, uh, the Spanish uh, with 9%, the Portuguese with 8%. That was all just not even mentioned. And the reason was because you had monetary union, and within a monetary union, these things automatically balance, and therefore you don't have to worry about it. Uh, this was a huge failure of competence, a failure of imagination, a failure of governance, that the ECB fell into that narcotic spell. And of course, they do admit it now, that they say we didn't pay enough attention to the underlying imbalances in countries' economies. This is nothing to do with the budget deficit of Greece, which was only later revealed to have been fraudulently manipulated. Uh, that's another story altogether, although it's clearly linked to it. This was the current account uh, deficit. So that's really the difference between what a country uh, earns in its exports, visible and invisible goods, uh, and, uh, and what it has to pay out for imports. And that was clearly known. And if the Europeans had just been a little bit more alive to what was going on in the rest of the world, they would have noticed that in Asia in the 1990s, uh, a number of Asian countries had been linked by a currency peg, nothing like so formalistic as monetary union, from which there is proverbially, proverbially no escape. They had a currency peg under which they were fixing their currencies to the dollar. And the Asian uh, countries in the 1990s, uh, they also ran up large current account deficits. But the current account deficits, on the whole, were half as large and went on for only half the time as the massive imbalances that had been built up 
in monetary union uh, since it started in 1999. So again, it was really not a surprise that this big uh, difference in the country's creditor positions and debtor positions would suddenly strike home and become a real obstacle. And again, there was a failure of imagination and a failure of analysis. Uh, here I would point my finger at the Germans. I don't point my finger at the Germans for being better than other people. I mean, that is their won't. And, and there's nothing wrong with being competitive. There's nothing wrong with matching up to the best countries in the world. But I do blame the Germans for this self-righteousness, which says that if they have a surplus, which is their right to do so, by doing better than other countries might do, uh, I do blame them for not seeing that the counterpart to their surplus is somebody else's deficit, somewhere else in Europe. And that, that deficit needs to be financed. So there was a failure of what you might call holistic thinking on the part of the Germans. They thought they could just sail on uh, chalking up large surpluses, current account surpluses, year by year, by doing better than anybody else, not realising they were obviously, by definition, building up claims on other countries. Quite a few of them would be in southern Europe. And therefore the deficits of the southern European countries were automatically showing up as claims by German banks or German bondholders on those countries. And those uh, deficits, those liabilities, would have to be settled one day. And liabilities uh, and claims do not always match perfectly because even if you can't change the currency, sometimes the creditors demand a change in interest rates. And that is exactly what happened. So it's a complete classic case of when credit uh, and debit uh, falls out of balance. I'll just elaborate just slightly on this. The Greeks went into monetary union, as did the Portuguese, uh, with net debts more or less of zero. You know, their net uh, foreign assets were more or less balanced out by their net liabilities. After 10 years of running up a current account deficit of 10% a year, for 10 years, you don't need to be a Nobel Prize winner to work out they will then have a net foreign debt of 100% of GDP which becomes progressively less easy to finance at the same interest rates as Germany. I mean, it's fairly obvious stuff. And yet everybody seemed to be surprised when this bubble burst. Now, I do know that, uh, that various people did point out that there were bubbles forming. I know because I was one of them. I do remember um, assailing Jean-Claude Trichet at one conference. I think it was about history, a history conference in Portugal. And I said, Jean-Claude, what's all this about the credit bubbles are building up in Europe. You know, what have you got, got to say about that? And I always really like the ugly fairy that turns up uninvited at the baptismal feast of the young princess. You know, it was not really a very polite thing to say. Uh, and yet people clearly should have said that. If you talk to Jean-Claude Trichet now, of course he will say, well, of course, you know, mon cher David, I did go around, I made all those representations at the famous Eurogroup. I had my coloured charts of countries which had lost competitiveness, unit labour costs. I showed those to the finance ministers. Do you know they didn't pay any attention? The point is, if you're talking to finance ministers trying to get them to change their mind and do things which are unpopular in their country, you've got to do a little bit better than just show them coloured charts every month. Uh, and therefore, I do actually blame the ECB uh, for part of this malaise that has now come about. Now, just scrolling forward very quickly, what is going to happen next? Um, if this is a long-running mystery play, and it is, uh, and if this is a Shakespearean tragedy, which, again, it is, then it's going to take still some while before we get to the denouement. We're still only probably in Act uh, 2, uh, Scene 1 or 2. It's going to be a long, long time before we actually get to the final scene where bodies are on the stage and the curtain <laughs> falls. Uh, but there will be bodies on the stage, there will be blood, but it will be a whodunit. We won't quite know who plunged in the dagger. And I'm pretty sure that the Germans will do everything they can to make sure that their fingerprints are not on this dagger. Because if there's one prediction that I would make, uh, it is that a country like Greece will have to leave sooner or later, but it will be a sovereign Greek decision. It will not be because the Germans or anybody else have told them to leave. It will have to be done on a perception of what Greece's best interests are. I cannot say when that will happen, but I think it will not happen as a result of any kind of diktat. It will have to be done as part of a, a sovereign decision. But it goes without saying that the gaps now in Europe are still very large, uh, but, and above all they are cultural and sociological and psychological gaps between the culture of the creditor 
and the culture of the debtor, with both sides building up very large imbalances vis-a-vis -vis each other. I won't go into all the details of the European stability mechanism and all those different things. We can talk about those afterwards if you'd like to, but it's quite clear there's now an emerging gulf between the people who are owed money and, and the people who owe money. And both sides, for good reasons, good legitimate reasons, feel equally resentful. The countries which are giving the money feel that the countries which are owing the money are uh, increasingly uh, less grateful for this. And also, the creditors have less and less certainty that they will be repaid. And of course, they won't be repaid, because creditors never get repaid. You always have to accept there's going to be some write-downs. And the countries which, of course, are being lent the money, and Ireland is now in that case, uh, those countries do feel I increasingly embittered because they feel that the conditions that are being applied to those loans are increasingly onerous and are driving them even tighter into a spectre of debt deflation, whereby the real level of the debt becomes greater every year. They are not inflating away the debt, it's just the very opposite. So I think that's the most dangerous gangrene that's really uh, biting into Europe right now. And how to escape that spiral, something which we might discuss. Just a final two words, one on Ireland and then the other, how to analyse this situation in a way which might be helpful. And these two things are, are linked. Now, I do think that Ireland is sui generis for all the historical, cultural reasons that we know about. I do think that Ireland has got its retaliation in early by recognising the crisis before other countries did in southern Europe, and actually starting in this process of what you might call internal devaluation. They realise you can't devalue, devalue the Irish punt because it doesn't exist any longer, and also the euro is not going to decline against the dollar in a very significant way because the Germans and the other creditor nations don't want it. So the Irish have done the right thing. They have analysed the situation. They've realised that they've got themselves into a mess, above all because of the banks and because the private debts have now become the public debts through the mechanism that you will know. So the Irish have been sui generis, they've done the right thing, they've taken their medicine, they're still only probably less than halfway through all the medicine that needs to be taken, but the Irish, I think, have got a very good chance of staying the course, coming out of this as members of the, the new euro, which will be quite a hard, quite a steely currency. Uh, it's up to the Irish whether they do carry on on that road. I think the other northern creditors uh, would like the Irish to stay the course and be part of this. They're not going to show any particular favouritism to the Irish, but I think the Irish do have it in them to stay the course. And that's partly a question of pride, but also there's patience. The Irish people do have a certain amount of patience, which is not uh, totally inexhaustible. And I think after a certain amount of time, uh, the Irish would be absolutely legitimate in going to Brussels and saying, we are paying over the odds for this money. I don't think you can do it yet. I think you need uh, another six months or maybe a year of taking it on the chin and building up a track record and paying every debt on time and filling in every Troika report on time and doing everything totally by the board. And then, particularly if you can go to Brussels with a lot of allies, and I understand the new government is thinking about wh where are its allies in Europe and who is it going to go in shoulder to shoulder with when it comes to real bruising negotiation with the Germans and the other, and the other creditors. You know, you need to go into Brussels with a really well thought out plan. And I would actually talk to the Swedes and the Danes outside the euro as well, because they are every bit as important as the creditor countries within the monetary union. I'm not trying to encourage Ireland to somehow achieve an even greater gulf between the countries of Europe than there is already by separating the euro up into the kind of non-euro members and the euro members. But the Swedes and the Danes are really very good countries uh, with whom one might forge some common alliance here. Um, the second point is that I think this great um, story of what went wrong, how this dream has been subverted, and how the political ambition has been turned into dust in, in a very bitter way, um, and the way that we won't have political union uh, worthy of the name uh, amongst uh, enough countries to make this something meaningful, the way that all these, these great hopes have been dismantled, I think it is worthy of some thorough analysis. And therefore, I know there's a great number of books and articles and all sorts of scholarly dissertations have been written in Ireland uh, about this. Uh, and I think it's to the tribute of the Irish people that they have done this, because I don't notice the same thing happening in Greece, for instance. But I do think this spirit of inquiry uh, needs to be widened, not in a finger-pointing way, but in a way which does 
try to show how this project has gone wrong, because it has gone very, very wrong indeed. And you do have to overcome the hubris of the European elites in whose name this project was forged. And you do need to try to find out where the mistakes were made. And therefore, I think something uh, almost like a South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission is needed on a European-wide scale. Um, it would probably be a distinguished uh, Irish uh, ex-diplomat or lawyer who would be in charge <laughs> of this, but it would be a, a properly put together and properly empowered uh, commission. And you'd have to decide when to ask this commission to start work and whether now is the right time, I really do not know. But I think it does need to be done at some stage. And this commission does need to have the power to arraign witnesses. It has to have the power to intercept emails. It has to have the power to go to the European Central Bank and say, look, I'm terribly sorry, I know you've got a lot to do, but we'd actually like to look at the documents. And if you don't let us, we'll come back tomorrow with a police escort to do it. I really do think that you do need to look at what went wrong here, in the, in the nicest possible way, of course. Uh, and so that is my suggestion. I'm not saying this has to be done now, but I do think that is necessary because many dreams have been shattered, many ordinary people's lives who are totally blameless in this because they just believe what the politicians told them. Many ordinary people's lives uh, have been very damaged by this, not just in Ireland, but in other countries as well. So I do think a proper spirit of inquiry would not just serve the hunger for facts and hunger for intrigue of scholarly people such as ourselves, but would produce some sort of healing for what has been a very damaged project. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.